talk about something that's only slightly less fun than roller coasters. <laughs> Gantt charts. You all know Gantt charts? Anybody use Gantt charts? Gantt charts show project schedules and illustrate the start and finish dates of every element on the project. For example, here's an oversimplified Gantt chart. It's a typical digital project that might have maybe your strategist who's your information architect or your user experience designer starting work. Then the designer picks up next, then the developer closes it all out. But oftentimes this chart ends up reading like a bar graph, right? And on, on, on this graph, the x-axis is easy. We know what that is, that's time. But what's the y-axis? As hard as it is to admit, the y-axis sometimes means importance to the project. Right, if you think about it, the strategist or the UXer usually leads project definition or discovery, and they don't start until all of the stakeholders and all of the team members are present. And the developers, of course, you all get the short end of the stick. Forget not having stakeholders, you're often asked to work on projects or forced to work on projects where the requirements are half-baked or not even existent. Now, isn't this backwards? After all, you can create a website without UX, even though the site may not be well-researched. You can create a website without a designer, even though the site might not be beautiful. The only person that you need to create a website is the person that writes HTML, right? That's the only requirement for a website, not even CSS or JavaScript. It may not look good, or it may not function robustly, but that's our base. So instead of importance, and keep your eye on this, on this y-axis here, I like to think about it as more effort over time which probably, if we were to graph that out, doesn't look like this. It probably looks a little bit more like this, right? If you think about the effort that a person puts into a project per roll. Now, you may notice that these look suspiciously similar to the roller coaster track that we just saw a few minutes ago. So if you take your strategist roller coaster ride, for example, they have sort of a splash mountain scenario if you've ever been to Disney World. It's one big drop, but not a lot of anticipation. Not that fun. Designers, they get a nice climb and a nice drop, but it seems like a pretty short ride. And it kind of sucks to wait all that time just for that. Developers, as you all know, you have it the worst. A steady ascent, going all the way to the top, building suspense, no payoff. And here's the real kicker. I bet none of you go to a theme park or go to a roller coaster ride with your friends, but then you go to ride separate roller coasters. Half the fun is sharing the experience together, right? The same is true for work. The fun comes from being on the same ride together at the same time. So if this is not a good shape for a project, what's a better shape? Here's a screenshot of the GitHub activity from a recent project I worked on. 
Now the first two boxes are the activity of the developers on the project. Pretty typical, pretty expected there. Writing a lot of code for a lot of the time during the project. But maybe more unexpected is the, are the two boxes here at the bottom and maybe the one at the end. The designers on the project. That's right, everybody was writing code on this project. Now why were we all doing this? So that we could ride the roller coaster together and so that we can better work together. Throughout this talk, I'm going to try and point out some of the ways that you and the teams that you work on can work better together and collaborate better together, perhaps in a couple of ways that might be new to you. I'm going to also leave a little bit of time at the end for questions in case there's anything I can expand on further. So I'd love it if you followed along with that perspective in case you have questions that we can discuss at the end. Here's another way to say how teams should work together. Right? We, we always hear that teams should work in a more agile fashion, but a lot of us don't really know what that means. I talk to a lot of designers and developers at conferences like this, and when I coach product teams and agency teams, they're quick to admit that even though they're on an agile team or a scrum team, they don't really know how to fit into the process. Even though the whole organization says, oh yeah, we're, we're agile here, that often means, well, we're waterfall with design and then agile when it comes to engineering. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Does anybody work at a place like that? A few. I've seen this situation plenty of times before, I've also witnessed how a little bit of a tune-up on the process can work wonders. It's really important to me. I'm probably the only creative director on the planet that also has a Scrum certification. Here's a quick image search for the, the term Agile. And let's focus on one of these. Regardless of what you call these phases, you can call it build, measure, learn, or discover, design, develop, or scope, define, refine, whatever you want to call this cycle. If this doesn't look like a three loop-de-loop -loop track, for a roller coaster that we can ride together, I don't know what does. This is the kind of roller coaster project that we should be doing together and collaborating on. So how do we work this way? Well, the way to work this way, and, and if you're a developer or an engineer, you know that breaking work into small, easily accomplishable chunks is a way that we can iterate over this continuously through the course of a project. Now, developers or engineers, they, they know this. They're really good at this. The premise of any good Kanban board or Agile board or Trello board is that small components of work can move independently of each other. And web developers can lean on decades worth of established software development techniques like, and concepts like encapsulation and immutability and all these architecture patterns that help you figure out how to write code that's both modular but also works with a whole. But designers, designers are now just generally coming around to this idea. Not that the reference doesn't exist, it's just that we're only now beginning to look for it in earnest. I think that explains why reference material like this is rising to the surface over the last few years. You probably won't hear a talk about pattern libraries or design systems without a reference from this book on the left here. This Christopher Alexander's A Pattern Language. And designers are always all a flutter when the next standards manual revival hits Kickstarter. I know I usually am. I'll buy all of these on Kickstarter. So how do we take this wisdom from other industries and other medium and apply it to ours. How can designers start to work together in small pieces like engineers do and like developers do and really start to become an integral part of any Agile product cycle? Does anyone recognize this site? Has anybody seen this? It's a couple years old. This is the Nike Better World site from 2011. Now it's certainly much more commonplace now, but this is actually one of the first sites to use Parallax and actually popularize it. It was created by my friend Ian Coyle. He's a designer, developer hybrid. He lives in Portland in the US. I was really blown away by this site when I first saw it. And so I called Ian to find out how he could come up with something like this and, and what was at the time a pretty novel idea. Now all sites use parallax, but this is one of the first. And Ian gave me a really simple answer. He said, once I came across the parallax thing, which honestly I was just tooling around in the web inspector, and I, and I did this by accident, I spent all of my time on the project just on that piece, just the parallax, making it as tight as possible. Everything else I just left plain. Because if you make everything on the site special, then nothing on the site is special. And if we take kind of a screen grab of this site, and I looked at the site from that lens, I realized how right he was. I mean, look, look at this screen. Without the parallax, it's a pretty standard web pattern. Even in 2011, title, body copy, call to action, image on the side. It's just, it's pretty plain. That's something that we see a lot. But that just one special tidbit, the parallax, it elevates the whole experience. It's like having a subtle amount of the right seasoning on a dish. Now the problem is that designers 
are notorious for designing too big and at the wrong time. And this is what I mean. So let's say, for example, you're creating an article, right? And this is what you want it to look like. Most designers start designing like they're reading a book. They top to bottom, left to right, right? They always start with the header. And designers will set up grids and obsess over the right point size and over headings and subheads and fine tune the spacing of navigation and spend extra long getting the right search icon in place. But all of those things are a waste of time to do at first. Now why is that? Because any developer that's worth their salt can set those things up in minutes. Right? Mark talked about this a little bit yesterday in his talk. Rather than spending half a day designing all of the elements, a five minute conversation between a designer and developer can have the developer working on placing headings and subheads and paragraph text and drop caps and nav items and user avatars on a page really quickly. You don't need to know at this stage, in an early stage, whether the headline should be 54 points or 56 points. That's stuff that you can decide in the browser later on. So instead, it's more worthwhile to focus on the small tidbits of the page that are going to make the page unique or make the whole site unique. Maybe you or your company has content like stats of your competitor or that your competitors don't have. Maybe it's a visual element or an, or an animation style, just one small tidbit. Maybe it's a type of functionality that's going to make this section really special and really make the page shine. This is the stuff to make special. Don't be afraid to make everything else just plain and conventional. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, but maybe you have something special in mind for the radio display. So how do you figure out which things are actually worth making special? I try to use urgency as the main driver for what to focus on. Whatever's the most urgent is what I should get done next. So how do you determine what's the most urgent? Well, I think there are three ways. If you have a product or a site that you already work on, that already exists, chances are that something's not working as well as it should be. I'm, I'm not talking about an error, I'm not talking about a bug, just something that's buggy. Right? More, more like, like the experience isn't as good as it could be. Maybe it takes your users too long how to figure out how to, say, pay a bill or find a particular piece of information, that kind of stuff. So that's usually the first thing to work on. The second most urgent, th urgent thing tends to be heavily requested features. So if everything works fine now, but you know something could be better. Maybe clicking in a certain text boxes could copy automatically the contents to the clipboard. Right? Maybe that's something that you want to focus on. Maybe your onboarding could use a tune-up. Right? That's probably the next most urgent thing to work on. Lastly, and I think this thing is very important, especially important if you're creating a product or a site from scratch, what are you excited about? What idea is just clawing out of, out of your head and it just can't wait to get its way into pixels? What can't you stop yourself from working on, even if it's not the, at the top of your product manager's backlog? One of the most valuable lessons that I learned about leading teams is that I get the best work out of people when they're excited about what they're working on. So that's so important to me that I often let the excitement drive product cycle and passion drive product cycle by asking each person on the project, what are you excited about working on? What do you want to work on next? and letting that kind of drive where people go. Uh, last year, my team and I did some work with a company called Dot Dash. Now, probably you haven't heard of Dot Dash before because it's the brand new name for a company that you, maybe you have heard of that's been around since 1997. It's the new name for About.com. Is anybody familiar with About.com? A few people. I bet most of you, and maybe all of you, have heard of About.com, but I bet you probably couldn't place when you've been to About.com. And actually, I think the chances are pretty high that you have been to about.com recently and you didn't even realize it. And that was part of the problem to fix. You see, about.com was originally designed as a content portal in the late 90s. And the way that it, it worked in the business model is basically you enter a query into your search engine of choice. They have high-ranking content, so you go to the site and you read about what you want to, and then you leave and you probably never realize that what site you're on. And the aesthetic of the site didn't really help either. The site just felt like generic internet. This is the CEO, Neil Vogel, and he explains the problem with that. Neil said, nobody cares about a general information site anymore. You can't have symptoms of colitis content on the same domain that you have how to unclog my drain and how to cook beer battered chicken and how to fix my tendonitis. So what they decided to do was break up all their content into separate verticals that serve specific content to specific users. So instead of having about.com slash health, about.com slash tech, slash money, slash home, my team and I helped them to create sites like, standalone sites like VeryWell, LifeWire, The Balance, and The Spruce. And we launched each of these in the same year. We worked on all of these last year, on average about three months per vertical. 
Now that includes naming the whole thing, doing all the identity work, UI design, front end design, back end development, redoing the CMS. I don't know about your product cycle, but I think that's pretty fast, three months for each of these properties. So I want to share a little bit about how we did it. And the main thing that we did was we focused on what was most urgent. So here's a piece of what that process looked like. The first thing we did was we got everyone in the same room that was working on the site. Designers, product managers, product, project managers, developers, engineers, QA, content, everybody in the same room. And we had a short brainstorm with this driving question. What is going to make this site special? What are the few things? And after a short discussion, we had a really great list to choose from. So what we did was, like I said, we got all these people in a room, and we asked everyone to break up into groups based on what they had the most ideas for. So each table was a designated topic area. So one table tackled image galleries. Right? All the people that, want, that had an idea for image galleries sit at this table. Another table was, what ideas do you have for video? Do you think video is going to make this site shine? What about e-commerce integration? What about advanced search? So everybody kind of broke up into these multidisciplinary, cross-disciplinary teams based on their area of interest. And essentially, what we did was we held a half-day hackathon where these cross-disciplinary teams worked together on a particular topic area. And like any good hackathon, at the end of those few hours together, we did kind of a demo day of sorts where each team debuted their early ideas for what could make the site really special. So for example, we had engineers here like Dan who showed a couple of code pens that they whipped up over the last few hours on how to hack Vimeo videos to auto-scroll you down the page at certain time codes. So where that was useful is in a how-to video that had the transcript on the page. Once it got to the next step, you auto-scroll down the page. Designers like Rob here screen shared their Photoshop and sketch canvases to show how to best visualize the difference between articles and image galleries. Right? So on this site that we were working on, articles and image galleries were both pretty prominent, but it was important to distinguish between the two. So Rob showed how we could actually visualize that. Now in a couple of hours, what we're doing is we're designing and coding just small pieces of the site. Not the entire thing, not full pages, because we don't need those quite yet. Just the bits that are going to make it special. And this is the start of what Rob was doing. This is the start of what I like to call an element collage, which I think is a great place for a designer and a developer and an engineer to begin exploring their most urgent ideas. It's not as complete as a full page design, but it's also not as abstract as a mood board. It's squarely in the middle of the two. If you've never tried your hand at element collage before, I have a few guidelines. But the basic premise is you work on small pieces, just the pieces that are important. Not everything. Don't worry about the header or the footer or the headline or the subhead. If that's not important to the idea you have, just work on the component, designing it, coding it, prototyping it. So I have three tips for you in making an element collage, and I'll show you a couple of examples. The first guideline for an element collage is to work with a really big canvas. If you're using Photoshop, make it 2,000 by 2,000 minimum. If you're using Sketch, don't use an artboard. Keep the default canvas so that it's infinite. Right? You don't have any boundaries around it. The idea is to let the content and the ideas inform the canvas size, not the other way around. So don't introduce an artificial constraint this early. The next guideline is make all of your elements different sizes, and randomly so. Avoid common device sizes. No 320s or 480s or 540s or 768s or 1024s. Start with a footer if your idea is the footer. Start with a footer that's 1123 wide. Then, let's say the next, the next piece you're working on is a mortgage calculator. Make that 317 pixels wide. And this is going to keep you on track for making sure your design language works at multiple sizes and every sizes and all the points where your design breaks, the break points. Lastly, have fun. So many designers and developers and engineers don't get the chance to just kind of go wild on it because you're working on a product that already exists or you're working within existing brand guidelines. This is your chance. You can always rein it in later, but an element collage is a perfect way to just flex a bit, explore typography, explore functionality, explore animation, explore prototyping. Other than that, there's really no format. Your element collage can look however you want it to. Just let it be that, a collage of all the elements that are, that are coming out of your head. It can contain whatever's relevant to what you're working on. If you need reference, you can do a quick Google search on element collage or a dribble search for element collage, and that should return a few samples of how designers and developers have been using them differently. I want to show you a few that I've worked on just to give you a sense of how different they could be. This is one that I did for, uh, for the, my team did for Radio Free Europe. And you see it's just a random smattering of elements, and it's just what ideas we had. 
So knowing that typography was going to be important, we explored typography, and we explored carousels, and we explored scheduling and a calendar element, and even what the animation style on a particular icon would actually be. So this is one example of what an element collage could look like. And it's really just kind of one big canvas where you're collecting things. It's not as abstract as a mood board. It's not just inspiration. It's actually elements that could be on the site. Here's another one, very different. This was for a, a, a university. Um, and one of the things that was really important there was figuring out the schedule of events. So kind of looking at a, on a phone, on a landscape view, what would a schedule of events look like with sort of a fixed header. Um, again, we don't even know if the information architecture was sound yet. Just kind of exploring with the visual language, exploring typography, looking at, at type specimens, exploring the color palette by making crazy accordions that we don't know if we're going to use quite yet. Here's a, a different element collage for that same university. So again, just exploring different styles. What does this look like on a tablet? Should we use cards? What should those cards look like? Would gradients work here? What about the shadow? What type of shadow? So just exploring kind of the look and feel and the animation and the interaction, this is a really good place to do that in a very, very easy way. I want to jump back to one of the about.com properties that we worked on, which is called Very Well. This is a formerly about.com slash health. So this is their health property, which turned into Very Well. We knew that the typography was going to have to work pretty hard to strike the right tone. So these sites are really, really content rich, and they're often the first place that someone goes when they find out that they or a loved one have a terminal disease. So the art direction really needed to do its fair share to be professional and to be courteous to the reader without being too in your face. So we explored what that range looked like. Square corners, rounded corners, somewhere in the middle. What typography actually matched that? How does that typography influence the, the elements and the, and the UI on the site itself? How does that influence the logo? One of the other things that the data science team uncovered is that many users, users tended to explore everything within a topic. So for example, if, they want, if somebody came in trying to look for something about allergies, they'd read one article after the other about allergies. They would just read as much content as they could get. That gave us a case for sort of an infinitely scrolling article experience that loaded article after article as you just scroll down the page related to the main topic that you're on. And that was a decision that paid off really nicely in terms of time on site. We also decided to make each topic area more of a branded, contained area by creating a unique custom illustration style for each topic area. So everything from Alzheimer's to arthritis to, from, to acne to yoga, everything in between, every topic feels like a uniquely curated area of exploration, even though it's dynamically driven. For the balance, the balance was the new finance site. The goal was really to de demystify money so that anyone can understand it. And when we were doing research, we came across these old, beautiful Pelican book designs that struck the right tone of iconic imagery that boiled concepts down to their visual essence. So what we did was we took those and translated those small handful of topic areas in a user's journey to better understand money, which in turn influenced the color palette, the brand typography, and the overall identity. Right? So using that point of reference to kind of modernize it a little bit more. Those are just a few of the ways that designers can break design work down into smaller chunks. Instead of working on full pages like the home page or the about page, how can we work on just elements and components? And then, and in that way, work more collaboratively and at the same pace and the same clip as developers and engineers. But there's also a more direct way, which is to jump into the code itself. Now, every so often, Twitter erupts in this whole should designers code debate. Anybody seen this? Anybody participate in this? I'm sorry. There's an easy answer to this. Should designers code? And the answer is not, well, yes, because John, John Maida said so in Wired Magazine, even though it's a pretty good reason. The answer is not even the all-famous non-answer, it depends. The answer is yes, designers should code. And to make it more clear, this is not actually the right question. The question is, should designers learn a thing that makes them better? And the answer is yes. The answer is always yes. But there's a second part to this. Should designers learn a thing that makes them better? Yes. Will it be okay if they don't? Yes. But let's say you're one of the designers that does want to learn to code, or you're a developer and you work with a designer that wants to learn to code, but you don't know exactly where to start. Well, I have some tips, three tips to be exact, three places to start for a designer who wants to learn to code. The first thing, the first thing that a designer can learn is CSS, but not all of CSS, just font sizes and colors. That's a really easy place to start. And if you're a designer and you don't know where to code, uh, if you're a developer, this might be a little bit elementary, but if you're a designer, don't worry about layouts, don't worry about responsive. You can leave that to your engineers, at least for now. 
just learn font sizes and colors, and they're really easy to learn. Font size, to specify a font size, you write font dash size, and then you write the font size, and then you write the units next to it. Pretty easy. And for colors, you use hex colors, and you can just specify them by saying color, colon, and then a hex code next to it. Now, this is a really elementary example, and I would imagine that most of the people in this room already know how to do that. But I think there's a, 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 there's a reason that I'm stepping through this at such a basic level. Are there any of you out there, I imagine most of you are developers, any of you that want to start doing some mentoring, but maybe don't know where to start? So one place that you could start, especially with a designer on your team who maybe is open to a little bit of mentorship, is you teach them a little bit of CSS. Right? And don't, you don't have to worry about teaching them floats and flexbox and grid and, and anything like that until later. But where to start is with colors and font sizes. If they're open to that mentoring, just teach them this little bit of CSS and then put them in charge of this on the site. And then you can have them put it into practice by saying, you're in charge of all the font sizes and all the background colors in, your comp, in the comps and in the code and in the, our prototypes in a working environment, not just Photoshop or Sketch or where you might be comfortable. Right, so that's a way that you might start a little bit of mentorship for that. The second thing, once a designer has a, a grasp on font sizes and colors, is maybe you could teach them the web inspector. Maybe if you're a designer, you can learn the web inspector. Because you already know how to change colors and font sizes, you can screw with, each other, with people's websites. I've always thought that Google had, would have been great if it was just kind of a lime green background. That would have made it perfect, I think. And uh, I'm, I'm not crazy about the Arial typeface on Google, so I think Comic Sans would be probably a better typeface for Google, more appropriate. And it also feels a little bit small, so I think if we just blew up the font size to maybe, you know, 60, oh, it's perfect, perfect. That's great, right? And if you can muck around with Google and you can muck around with your own site, then you can muck around with other people's websites too. It's fun. Um, and this is a way that I imagine a lot of us started learning code, was just opening the web inspector or the web developer extension or and just messing with people's websites and changing font sizes and colors and backgrounds and seeing what broke and figuring out how to fix it again. Did anybody start coding that way? I know I did. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people here. So this is a good way to get your designers to code a little bit more. The last thing, and I think this is a really powerful thing, is once they've gotten a grasp of CSS and the web inspector, is really to learn JSON. I think that's a great place to start learning code because it's unintimidating. And if you don't know JSON, if you're a designer or if you're a developer that doesn't know JSON, what you can do with JSON is actually just write configuration files that control things. So it's a simple format if you don't know it. It basically works with a key value pair. There's a key on the left, which is uh, the main color or a base font size or an accent color, and then a value associated with that, which might be a hex color or a size or a number or a string or something like that. And you can write all these configuration files that actually control other things. So getting a designer or being a designer that learns JSON could actually unlock a couple of doors for you. And I'll give you some examples of that. This is uh, the Lightning Design System by Salesforce. And one of the things that they use a ton across their design system is these design tokens. And what they're doing is they're just describing keys and values for everything in the design system. Colors, sizes, backgrounds, uh, animation durations, things like that. And it's, this exports to a bunch of different formats. So it exports to SAS, it ex but one of the, the formats that it does export to is JSON. And you can use that JSON to control many things, either in an app or a web application or a website or, or anything that kind of uses that configuration. So one of the things that I suggest, and I'll, I'll follow back up on this in a few minutes, is this. If you're a designer and you're working with a developer, you could ask them this. You can say, dear developer, could you please set this up, this website, this app, so that it's driven by a JSON config file? That way, I can work on the visual details separately, and don't forget this part, you don't have to worry about it. If you're a developer, you could, you could encourage your designer to think this way too. Dear designer, I created a simple JSON configuration file for you. I know it looks intimidating right now if you don't know it, but all you need is a one minute explanation from me, and then you'll get it. That way, you can tweak the details to your heart's content without being reliant on me, right? And these are ways that we could start to work together and not necessarily have to work on the same thing, but figure out where we overlap. We'll come back to that concept in a bit. I used to be a design director at a digital creative agency in Brooklyn called Big Spaceship. Now, in Flash's heyday, they did some of the best Flash work around. This is an example. Uh, this site was part of a campaign for Epson called Epsonality. And on this site, you can drag around a series of sliders to find out what type of printer best suits your personality. Right? You could say, I want more, 
more photos or more documents or high priced or low priced or consumer or professional. And as you play with the sliders, the printers at the bottom sort of raise and lower to respond to the changes that you're making. There's really a huge number of possibilities that you could end up with. Right? All sorts of different con configurations of this. Now, rather than the developers writing a crazy algorithm to try and assess the weighting of the system and all that, they instead gave the client this tool, a really crude tool where you could work backwards. So you start from the results that you want. Right? So if you see the column there on the, on the right, you can kind of drag the printers in order of preference as a client, and then dial in the sliders to say, OK, if the sliders end up like this, this is the result set that we want. And when they were happy with the result, if you take a look at the bottom right corner there, the client could then export a configuration XML file, which is similar to the JSON file we just talked about. And that's the thing that powered the whole application. And any time the client wanted to make changes to the weighting of the system, we didn't have to, re to rewrite any algorithms. We really just said, OK, we'll give us a new XML file, and, and that'll control the whole experience. And it created this kind of decoupling of concerns where the client could work on the content and the weighting as they wanted to, while the developers were working on, on the rest of the site. And, and one was not a dependency on the other. Pretty cool, right? Now, I don't know why this workflow doesn't happen more often. Well, actually, I do know. One of the big reasons is that our tools haven't evolved that much. Right? Designers are still doing the majority of their work in tools like Photoshop and Sketch and Illustrator and Figma. And developers are still doing the majority of their work writing code in code editors. This might as well be 2004. Right? Our tools really haven't changed that much. Only in the last few years have we seen a slow march toward changing this. Tools like Sketch are starting to change this. Engineers look at Sketch, and because of its simplicity, they say, yeah, I can understand a tool like that. And designers look at Sketch and say, yeah, I think I can make what I want in a tool like that. Right? That hasn't happened in a long time. Now, that's partly why Sketch is revolutionary, is because it's simple for all the people working on a project. Tools that are typically coding related, like Framer, are getting into the game too. They just released a teaser video on their site that features this new design slash code toggle. Right? It releases on May 31st, a few days from now. And you can sign up to get notified about it at framer.com if you're curious. I certainly am. But this design code toggle is really interesting here. Last month, Airbnb released their open source library called React Sketch, which allows anyone to write React components that render to Sketch documents. Again, this is something that we haven't seen much of before, using coding tools to make design artifacts. It effectively lets engineers and developers into the design process, which I think is a really great thing. What about the other way around? What about using design tools to make code? What does that look like? Well, wait a minute, you might say. Design tools making code? I've seen this before. <laughs> yes, many of us took the Dreamweaver bait years ago, and, and we hoped for the promise of designing visually with great code automatically generated only to have those dreams dashed as quickly as they surfaced. But upon reflection, there was really one main thing that Dreamweaver did wrong. It tried to do too much. In the mid-2000s, I helped start the Philadelphia office of a web design boutique called HappyCog. And if I do say so myself, we got pretty good at making websites around that time. Around that time, modern browsers supported web standards pretty well. Responsive design hadn't come along yet, so we didn't really have to tackle those complexities. And we all knew the Tantec hack by heart. So what we did was we started playing games to make it interesting. So for example, a designer on the team would make a comp like this one. And I'd challenge everyone to a game that I call CSS first. Now normally, after receiving a comp, we'd start to write HTML first, just to make sure we were progressively enhancing appropriately. But honestly, that got boring after doing it for so long. So I started to see if everyone could still write semantic, progressively enhanced code, but just from a different angle. Instead of writing HTML first, which we typically did, I challenged my coworkers to write CSS first without any HTML attached to it. It was an exercise in just being able to envision the code that you would write before you actually wrote it and could test it. So you'd write a CSS file, no HTML attached, and you'd declare it done. And once you declared it done, you couldn't touch it again. You had to put it away. Then when you were done with the CSS file, only then could you start writing HTML. You could start writing, starting your, start writing your markup. You'd write your HTML and just try to see how close you could get just by adding classes with the things in your CSS file. But you can't touch the CSS file again. And really, whoever got the closest without reopening and editing the CSS file got bragging rights for the day. It's a silly game. 
And it was mostly created to just keep us entertained. But as an industry, aren't we sort of searching for something like this nowadays? The smallest set of options that allows us to design mostly everything that we need? I've really started to design more and more like this lately, limiting my options as much as possible. Let me give you an example. Does anyone here use an eight-point grid? Has anyone heard of this? OK, a few people. So this is what an eight-point grid is. The general premise is that you use multiples of eight to define dimensions, padding, margin, or both block and inline elements. Essentially, essentially, it's like picking a magic number for your designs, except that you give it meaning by use it, using it consistently. And it doesn't have to be an eight-point grid. It could be a seven-point grid, or a nine-point grid, or a 10-point grid. But basically, everything in your document, in your CSS file, is multiples of whatever point size you choose. So here's an example. You can see the simple type scale. It's not a modular scale. It's really just a multiple scale. It can be created by using multiples of eight. And they're all 80 pixels apart, right? It's a multiple of eight. Uh, I have 64, 56, 48, 40, and 32 points, all multiples of eight. And this creates a subconscious harmony and rhythm in my design. And also, if I ever look through my CSS file and I see a 100 or a 17 somewhere in that CSS file, I know that I broke my eight-point grid system. Right? So it's kind of this subconscious constraint that you can use both in design and development. And this translates really well to code. You can make sure that everything is a multiple of eight. If not, you deviate it from your system. Right? Font sizes are multiple of eight. Margin bottoms, multiple of eight. Um, all of the measurements are multiples of eight, or whatever multiple you decide to choose. You can also add a little bit of complexity to make it more scalable. Right? You can turn that into variables. You can have your spacing set to eight. And then you can generate all the math of the margins and the, and the paddings and the spacings off of that multiple. Then later on, if you decide, ah, I'd like to change that multiple, let's see what a nine-point grid looks like instead. You change your spacing variable to nine, and it should cascade all the way through your system. Last piece of code for now. If you turn all of your options into mixins, which shouldn't be a big deal because you're keeping them limited so you don't have an infinite number, you can actually use them like ingredients in a limited pantry for a kitchen. It also makes painfully obvious where you've deviated from that system, which forces you to confront whether or not you'd actually like to do that. So in a lot of my CSS files, I'm generally just including styles that I've already defined. They could be fully baked. They could be one-liners. The complexity is up to you. But then at the bottom of each declaration, I have a custom area that says, where am I actually breaking that system, or where do I need to do something custom? Right? So I'm changing the top, the top to three pixels, which is not a multiple of eight. Um, and by having a specific spot for it, I'm forced to confront, do I actually want to do this, or is this something already defined in my system that I can use? This kind of already exists, right? That's why tools like Tachyons and Expressive CSS and Atomic CSS are really taking hold, because they're a little bit like CSS first. Write all the styles you need, then don't ever touch it again, and just try to apply HTML. But this is where it falls apart in the same way that Dreamweaver fell apart. They're trying to do too much. Let's bring this back to tooling and see how tooling can fix this. This is a typical sketch canvas. And what I've done is I've typed out a sentence, and I've selected it. Once it's selected, I have a bunch of options in the right panel. Let's zoom in on that right panel. So I have, I have infinite options. I could change this sentence in many, many ways. I could change the color. I could change the alignment, the spacing, the line height, the opacity, the blending mode, the, the weight. So many options to consider. But what would happen if I made my options more finite? Keep your eyes there on that right panel. What if instead of being able to change everything, I could only change it in a limited way? By limiting the options, we actually make it a lot easier for the design software to generate code that's expected and desirable. Where Dreamweaver got it wrong was that the possibilities and the combinations were infinite, so the software had to guess as to, as to what you wanted. When the options are more finite, the software has to guess less. When the options are more finite, it's more possible for designers and engineers to be using different tools to do the same thing. It'd be way easier to know that clicking on plus eight for size changes a class name from text small to text medium. So the tools can do the same thing, even though you're accomplishing them in different ways. And if that's the case, it'd be very possible to describe this whole document in a configuration file. And guess what that configuration file would be written in? JSON. In version 43 last month, uh, April, Sketch officially announced that they're moving from their previous binary fi file format to an open format. JSON. The foundation is already there for us to be working more collaboratively, but we have to do something about it. 
Right? So the format exists now. Now you can describe any sketch file as a JSON file. I think we've been going about this all wrong. For years, we've been looking at one tool or looking for one tool that everyone can use. What's the tool that designers and developers could work in simultaneously? But that hasn't worked for us yet. It's OK for designers to be using the tools that they're familiar with and they're comfortable with. And it's OK for developers and engineers to be using tools that they're comfortable with. Designers can continue to use Photoshop and Sketch and Illustrator. There's nothing wrong with that. Developers can continue to develop in their favorite IDEs. There's nothing wrong with that either. But when there's no overlap, that's where things get lost in the chasm between. Instead, let's look for the overlap within the tools that we already use. If a designer likes using Sketch and a developer likes using Pattern Lab, that's great. Where's the overlap in the tools? JSON. That's where you should collaborate. Sketch can output JSON. Pattern Lab reads in JSON. Designers, how can you structure your sketch files to output a JSON file that's the least work for the developer? Developers, how can you set up Pattern Lab to read in the JSON file that Sketch export that's the least work for the designer? Another example, let's say a designer enjoys working with Pattern Lab and the developer is working mainly in Drupal. Both Knud and Mark mentioned this yesterday in their talks. Where do they overlap? this mix of JSON and Twig. This is where we should be spending most of our effort. Another great example. Let's say you're looking to do some intricate animation. Designers like to use After Effects. There's a plugin for After Effects called Body Movin' that lets you animate an After Effects, then exports that to a JSON file and a JavaScript library that a developer can work with. We don't need complex tools. We don't need to look for the one holy grail tool that everyone can use. Instead, Small, simple tools that focus on the overlap will do just the trick. I want to go back to the sentiment for a minute. The smallest set of options that allow us to design just about everything we need. I think that's how I define a design system. I don't know that I've heard a canonical definition for a design system, at least not one that resonates with me, but this is the closest that I've gotten. Give me all the components that I need to create an interface, but nothing more. Give me all the guidelines that I need to create within the system, but nothing more. No wonder design systems are growing in popularity, not because they make us work more efficiently, but because as humans, we crave better and simpler ways to work together. In 2001, 17 people met at a ski resort to talk about how to work together better. What emerged was the Agile Manifesto, which I've come to really appreciate the more I try to put its principles into practice. Maybe my favorite of the bunch is the last one, working software over comprehensive documentation. If you think about the common artifacts that we make for our work, strategists writing documents, UXers making diagrams, designers making comps, developers writing code, which one of these people actually work on the software? It's just one. It's the developer that's mostly working on software. Everybody else works on documentation. <clears throat> As useful as they are, it's still documentation. Comps are documentation for what a website should look like. A brief is documentation for what a website should do. A diagram, a sitemap, is documentation for the architecture of a site. But it's not software. None of those things are software. If Agile is really a better way, and I believe it is, and if Agile favors working software over comprehensive documentation, why do we vote, devote most of our efforts on a project to the wrong side of the equation? Let's find better ways to all be working directly on the software a bit more. Now, you might be a little bit skeptical. After all, I basically just said, designers should code more, and developers should design more. Does that mean that everything is now everybody's job? Well, not really. <clears throat> Here's a framework that I like to use that clarifies a little bit. It's called the RACI matrix. Does anybody use the RACI matrix? Just a few. It's an acronym for responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. And here's how you use it. On one axis, you plot the roles of all the people on your team, and it's a simplified version. You probably have more roles on your team. Strategist, designer, developer, engineer, product manager, whoever's involved in working on the thing. On the other axis, you list all the tasks or topics that need to be covered to do successful work. So that could be everything from interface design to the icon style, to the tone of voice, to taxonomy, to all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> then you go through and you assign R, A, C, or I. Who is responsible for this thing? Who is accountable? Who is consulted? Who is informed? You'll notice that some rows, like the top row, have everyone responsible. 
On this project, everyone, strategist, designer, and developer, are responsible for the customer experience. That may be true for your project, it may not be. It changes from project to project, and that's okay. But like other things, icon style, for example, they might have some people that are responsible, say the designer, and some people that are just informed. Maybe the strategist is just informed of the icon style. When I'm coaching teams that start out pretty non-collaborative, the racy matrix matrices have just a lot of R's, and that's it, right? Somebody's responsible for this thing, no one else cares. And that's a problem. That means you're not collaborating well. Eventually, as teams get more collaborative, more A's and C's and I's get in there, right? So you see that even though somebody is responsible for a thing, you might want to be informed about that thing. Now, the whole grid doesn't have to be filled out. There could be some spots that are left missing, but the more they're filled out, the, that's a good sign, a good indicator that your team might be collaborating well. Because this, this creates overlap. It creates that overlap we were talking about, and it forces collaboration in the best ways. Perhaps Greg Veen, Typekit's product manager, said it best. He said, it all works better when you embrace the idea that product, design, and engineering are just different perspectives on the same thing. I'd like to leave you with these thoughts. Over the next year or so, commit to try to a bit more to work directly on the software that you and your teams are making. If you're already doing that, encourage your team members to do that. Designers, learn a little bit of code and chunk up your work so that it fits better into an agile world. Developers, build better tools for your colleagues, for your designers, for your product managers. Compel them to build better tools for you and together build better tools for your customers and your users. Serve each other better. When we can do that, we change the world. Thank you very much. So I think we have a few minutes for, for questions, uh, if anybody has any. I think there's one in the back. Thanks, Dan. Fantastic presentation. Um, you. you talked about uh, designers and small ele elements of development that they could learn in order to collaborate better. How would you approach it from the other perspective, whereby what elements of design could developers learn in order to collaborate better? Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking that. So the, just to summarize, the question is, I talked a little bit about like designers, if you want to learn a little bit of code, here's the ways to do that. But what about the other side? What about a developer who wants to learn a, a little bit of design? So I think one of the things, and, and this, is a, this is a humility thing, I think both parties have to be very humble in order to do this, designer, developer. Um, is to start really, really small with the simple things. As a designer, I might sit with a developer and say, I'm going to teach you about typography, or I'm going to teach you about colors. Or I'm, I'm going to teach you about how colors, what colors are cold and what colors are warm. And that seems so, so elementary, so basic. Um, and, and that's tough because it's somebody saying, it's essentially somebody saying to you, you're not as smart as I am, or at least you can come off that way. So I think the first ingredient there is about humility. So both parties have to, be, have to be humble. I also think that it helps when the person who wants to learn is the person who asks for it. Rather than me as a designer saying, I'm going to teach you about this thing, it would be easier if the developer said, hey, could you teach me about this thing? Right? That's a more humble inquiry there. So I think that's got to be the foundation of this. So I think one, one thing is to start at the very basic and then the other thing is to relinquish some of that responsibility. So I, I talked about the racy matrix. Designers tend to say, well, this is all mine. I own the typography. I own the motion style. I own the colors. Instead, relinquish some of that, right? Flip the racy matrix. If I'm an R, where can I become an I and you become the R? And it's same thing with developers, too. Well, I own the code. I own this because it has to be my way. Well, in order to get a designer working on it, you have to relinquish some of that responsibility to them. So I think those are some of the foundations for it is one is just being humble, and the second is being able to say, a thing that I am used to owning, I'm going to give that thing away, and I'm going to have somebody else be responsible for that, and I'll oversee, and I'll teach, and I'll guide, and I'll mentor, but I'm going to keep my hands off of it. One of the, the last thing to kind of sum it up, um, when I was learning, when I was in school, one of my best teachers, name is Jervis Thompson, he taught me this thing that I use to this day when I'm mentoring and when I'm teaching, which is hands off the keyboard. I never touch the keyboard. If I have to touch the keyboard and go, hold on, let me, let me just do this. I haven't done it well enough. So hand, hands off is usually a way that means you have to articulate, you have to speak, you have to say the things that, that you want in order to be able to teach it rather than, well, just watch me do it. It'll be fine because other people don't learn that way. So hopefully those are, those are some good tips that you can take and try. Hey Dan, that was great. Um, 
I really liked your definition of a design system. So I'm hoping you could give me some more definitions. Mm. Which is that in the racy diagram, the C and the I, that seems pretty clear. I'm always confused between what's the difference between being responsible for something and being accountable for something. Right. Okay, so uh, I wrote a post about this. So just to sum up the question, what's the difference between re being responsible and being accountable? Let me start with accountable because I think I have a better definition for that than responsible. Um, I wrote a post about accountability, and it was taken from, there's a U.S. senator named Cory Booker. And Cory Booker is pr a pretty progressive senator in the U.S., and he, he's a, the, formerly the mayor of a very, very, uh, how should I say it, a really rough town, Newark, New Jersey. And he has made really advanced strides in that town. Um, and part of what he does is he's on Twitter a lot. He responds to people through Twitter. He uses Twitter as a medium. And people think, oh, he uses Twitter, so he's really progressive. And, it, and so I saw a talk with him. It was at Brooklyn Beta. And somebody asked him, how, do, how did you get pro so progressive? Is it Twitter? And he's like, no, people think it's Twitter. It's because I enforce accountability at my, in my administration. And this is what I mean by that. There are three steps to accountability. So in accountability, the first step is that there are standards. Right? So you and I have to agree to a thing. Uh, for example, uh, I will finish this design by Friday. Right? We have agreed. I set it to you. I put it on a calendar somewhere. It's on a checklist somewhere. We have agreed to it. It's public. So standards are the first thing. The second is that you have to have a way to measure those standards. Right? So if Friday comes, Saturday comes, no design, I haven't met those standards. Right? We can measure that. If I just say, yeah, I'll get the design done, how do we measure that? So the time is one way to measure that. By when? By Friday. OK, Saturday hits, I've, I've missed the mark. And then the third, I think this is probably the most important one, is that there have to be consequences, both positive and negative, for meeting those measurements. If you don't meet those measurements, what happens? If you do meet those measurements, what happens? If I don't get this design done by Friday, my developer will not be able to code that starting Monday. That's a consequence. If I do meet this, this by Friday, or even by Thursday, maybe I could start on something in advance. That's a positive consequence. I don't know a good term for that. So in accountability, it's standards and measure those standards and consequences. So that's how I define accountability is as long as like, you, are, you are there with those standards, you can measure it, and, and there are consequences, then you can be accountable. Responsible is if this does not work, it is your fault. So I think maybe, maybe and I'm, I'm sort of coming around to this idea. I don't know if I have a good definition for responsible, but I think it's about where to place blame or praise. So I'll have to think about that one a little bit more, but that's what I've got so far. Anybody else? Hi. Uh, it was excellent first. Thank you. I would like to say, and uh, I think it's the first time I, I'm hearing someone talk about UX and uh, giving uh, giving me the um, configuration and documentation in the first place. And uh, this is just a notice. This is not to uh, an answer than a question, but uh, I think configuration and JSON, not exactly JSON, but configuration between one and the other team is the, and not only between designers and uh, developers, but between everyone. Uh, in a team is the new black. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's, that's thank, if, you. thank you for that comment. If I could just add to that, one of the things that's been really impactful for me over the last year, uh, year or two, is I read this book um, by Simon Sinek, who is most famous for his TED Talks uh, and a book that he wrote called Start With Why. But I like his second book even better, which is called Leaders Eat Last. And it's a book about leadership and collaboration and how leaders can, can work in that, in a mix on a team. And a lot of it is about service. So if each, each person on a team is looking toward how can I make everyone else's job easier, how can I actually make my job harder to make other people's job easier, if that's the, if that's the cost, um, that book was really impactful for me. So a lot of the ideas that I've been exploring over the last year or two have been about what ways can I serve other team members better, whether that's developer or product manager or other designers or art directors or, or whoever that are. So, so if, if you're interested in learning more about it, that's probably a good book to check out.
great presentation. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask, because we are talking uh, to, to fill the gaps before of design and uh, developers, um, uh, the tools are very important. And uh, of course, uh, uh, most of the tools are, uh, are not bridging the gap. Maybe they are separated. Uh, have you ever used uh, uh, Adobe MUSE? Have you? I feel that they trying to fill to 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 bridge the gap. Yeah. Between uh, and your opinion. Yeah. Thank so you. the, the question about Adobe MUSE, how how does that do? I haven't spent much time in MUSE. Um, I although I will say generally, I don't I don't know that I share the same opinion, which is that I think tools are actually less and less important. Right. So one of the things that drives me crazy is like. You know, I, I take photos casually, and I post my photos to Facebook, and I post them to Flickr, and I post them to you know wherever, and people go, "Wow, you must have a really good camera." I'm like, "That's not the camera," <laughs> you know, like, I'm, like I like to think I'm a pretty good photographer, you know, even though if, I'm an amateur photographer, but it's not the camera because that says anybody can go buy a camera and be an excellent photographer, and that's not actually the case. So I feel the same way about design tools, and I feel the same way about, you know, it's not the tool itself. The tool can help. If you're a good photographer, a good camera can enhance your photography skills. But I think it's the skill, not the equipment, right? A good, I've, uh, I'm also a musician, and I, I play the keyboard. And one of my favorite things I've seen lately is uh, one of my favorite pianists, Paris Bowen. He has a little toy Casio keyboard like, what, like kids use. And he makes this amazing composition on the thing. And I'm like, man, I had that when I was a kid. I, I can't do that. And I find that that's, that's really impressive. And it also says a lot about that person's skill. So I think I'm getting a little bit away from your question. But I haven't played much with Muse. But I don't see Muse or any tool as like, oh, this is the one. This is going to bring, you know, bring uh, balance to the force. <laughs> you know, I don't think that there's a tool that's actually going to be able to do that. Um, and actually, like, I've gone so far as to, on every project, to just force new tools. On, my, on myself, and sometimes if my team members are willing to. So sometimes from project to project, I'll go, what design tool should we use? And all the designers say, well, I haven't used Sketch yet. Cool, we're going to use Sketch this time around. Or you know, well, I had one project recently where a designer said, you know, I've heard about this new tool called Figma, and I'm cool, we're going to use Figma for this project. Just to kind of get the idea that the tools aren't the thing that makes it. It's the process. It's how we work together. It's how we're going to find the overlap between those tools. So I actually think that it's a pretty good exercise if you haven't tried it before. Encourage your team to use new tools. What do we use on this project? Sublime Text? Cool. Let's use TextMate. Let's use Visual Basic. Let's use, you know, let's use uh, our, uh, whatever, whatever that thing is to, because it helps enforce the point that the tools aren't the thing that make the project well. And if you can do that, if you have a couple of those under your belt where you say, on this project we use these tools, on this project we use these tools, on this project we use these tools, and all of them came out great, I think that's a good, that's a good testament for that. Was one more question? We can take it, and then we will have to close. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, love your work. Really appreciate this uh, presentation. Just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the impact of this process on billability and contracts. Uh, we do. My team and I do a lot of work with U.S. government. I know you have as well. Um, one of the biggest challenges I think that we've faced in trying to bring designers on board and developers on board, both including also back-end developers, trying to get them involved in the front-end process. Um, there's always the fear of billability. With the waterfall, everyone knows their role. You know, the designers and developers know that they have a, a steady job for the next six weeks or six months. But it seems with this, there's always the challenge that the client will expect hmm. cheaper and faster. Which may be great, but you know, in professional services industry, it's difficult. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. So to kind of sum that up, how do you mix a process like this, which is about new and trying new things and collaborating and really getting uncomfortable with the fact that projects have to be efficient too, especially on the billability end? So first of all, thank you, because now I can plug my book. Uh, I, I wrote a book about pricing called Pricing Design. Um, and it's about value-based pricing. Um, and I'm not going to delve too much in that, but I'll send you a royalty check. Thank you. Um, the premise is that the conversation with your client needs to change. And I know that some industries are regulated in a way that you can't change those conversations much. 
it's up to you whether you self-select out of those, right? So there are a lot of RFPs that I get that are like, this is the way that we want to do the project, and my response is basically, I don't think we'll be able to do good work under those conditions. Thank you for the consideration. Some agencies are not in a spot to do that. Totally respect that. Um, so I think part of that is what situation do you want to place yourself in if you want to try a process like this? I think the environment has to be right for it. Um, I think So another one of those conversations that I tend to have with clients is about billability. And the conversation I have with them is not, we're going to do this project in the most efficient way. The, the conversation I try to have with them from the initial sales conversation is, what would you like and how can I best get that to you? So they can say, well, we would love to have this and this and this and this. And I go, to simplify it, how much would you pay for that? Oh, we'd pay $200,000 for that. Great. That's the price. It's up to me to figure out, can I do it for $200,000 or $100,000 or $10,000 or $5,000 or whatever, whatever the price is. I want to know how much that is worth to them. And then can I do it for that? Then within that, I go, if we give you this thing, you'll be good to pay that amount? And they're like, yes. I'm like, cool. Let's just put that there. I'm going to go figure this out with my team now. And now I have the freedom to talk to my team about, how should we do this project? Do you want to try something new? Do you want to stick to the things that we, that we do well already? Because that could be a good thing. But I think that billability is a, sometimes an artificial constraint that actually puts a hold on this process where you can't break it open because, you go, oh, what about billability? Well, if you're profitable on the job, then you're profitable on the job. It doesn't matter how you get to profitability. Billability is one way, but it's not the only way. So if you have the opportunity to release that billability constraint, and that gives you the freedom to go, all right, well, we know we're going to be profitable. So with that in mind, if we know we can spend a limited time on this, as long as we can be profitable, we might put a cap on it. All right, team, we got 600 hours. What can we do with those 600 hours? Well, I'd like to try you know, a headless, headless Drupal install this time. Cool. Let's do that. Because now you don't have that constraint of like, well, it's not the most efficient. Because if that constraint is there, then people fall, it's an easy chain to fall back on. Well, what's efficient is doing it the way that we did it before. And doing it the way we did it before, it's going to have the same problems that it had before. So if you can kind of unlock that a little bit, that'll give you a little bit more opportunity for it. Thanks for that question. Thank you, everyone.